Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. I'm your host, Bob Tremblay. I'm a volunteer NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, the first Vice President of Michigan's Warren Astronomical Society, and an internet factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. This podcast comes from a recording of one of our monthly full moon meetups with the Vatican Observatory staff and Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Sacred Space Astronomy is the Vatican Observatory's online community. We have several astronomers and scholars who write articles on our website about astronomy, space science, and faith in science. Every full moon, the Vatican Observatory Foundation hosts a Zoom meetup for our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers. Typically, our guest will be a member of the Vatican Observatory staff or an affiliated researcher, and they'll tell us about the research they're doing and the journey that led them to the Vatican Observatory. Brother Guy Consolmagno, director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, will typically talk with our guest, and our Sacred Space Astronomy subscribers can ask them questions. This podcast was taken from the Full Moon Meetup on Sunday, October 9, 2022. Our guest was Dr. Heidi Hamill, Vice President for Science for the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, the Vice President of the Board of Directors of the Planetary Society, and an interdisciplinary scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. The night before this recording was made, Brother Guy and Dr. Hamill were at a reception for the Vatican Observatory at the Nunciature, which serves as an embassy of the Vatican to the United States. I'd like to introduce Heidi Hamill, our guest. Since we were also at the event last night and several people were amused at the way we met, can you tell people how you and I first met? When I first met Brother Guy, he was a rabbi. And uh, the reason he was a rabbi is because we were both participating in the MIT Musical Theater Guild production of Fiddler on the Roof. And he was the rabbi, and I was in the orchestra. It was very strange when I was supposed to be blessing the sewing machine, and I kept trying to, you know, no, no, that doesn't work. Don't do that. And, and there's a follow up, though, because uh, several years later, I ran into Brother Guy again, and he was wearing a clerical collar. And I said, oh, what performance are you in now? <laughs> Not knowing that he was a Jesuit brother at the time. So he set me straight with that. And, and my answer was, you know, does having the collar freak you out? Because it had happened that other people who had known me before I was a Jesuit suddenly got very uncomfortable when I was wearing the collar. And your answer was? Not at all. My mother wears a clerical <laughs> collar. She's a Lutheran pastor. So I'm used to that. So let's talk a little bit about your, your background, your growing up. Your, your mom was a pastor. What does your dad do? Yeah, my mom was actually not a pastor until late in life. Oh. It, it was a second career for her. Okay. When I was growing up, my mom was a nurse. And uh, my father worked in what today we would call HR. Back then it was personnel management. And there were no scientists in my family. I just... Uh, stumbled into science uh, later in life, um, but it was, I was not one of those kids that wanted to grow up being an astronomer. And so when kids ask me today, how can I do what you do? I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, I didn't plan for it. It just, I kind of stumbled into it in college. So you don't stumble into MIT. Well, I kind of did, actually. Um, when I was in high school, most of what I did was music. Um, we already mentioned I was in the orchestra for music for the MIT production of Fiddler on the Roof, and I was um, playing timpani and and chimes and the you know in the sunrise sunset you hear right. the chimes. I um I mostly did music percussion mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school, but I knew I didn't want to go into music because I didn't like practicing very much. <laughs> <laughs> and so I really, I kind of knew that. Um, and I really didn't know what I was going to do. At that time, I was living in Pennsylvania and everybody who lives there goes to Penn State. It's what you do. My dad went to Penn State. So I'm going to Penn State. But I had a math teacher who's uh, teaching us calculus. There were only four kids in the class. And one day she said, we're not doing math. We're going to talk about college. I said, okay, fine. She's, where are you going, Heidi? I'm going to Penn State. Mm -hmm. Why are you going to Penn State? Well, because my dad went to Penn State. She said, no, I think you should go to MIT. And I'm <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I've never even heard of MIT. It was not on my radar at all. She said, no, I, I think you should apply. And I asked my chemistry teacher, Mr. Dale Cresswell, Dale Cresswell, that's how you pronounce that. Um, <laughs> and he said, um, I asked him for a letter of recommendation. He said, no. And I said, well, why not? He said, you will never get into MIT. 
And so I asked my history teacher instead, Mrs. Mayall. And um, I did get into MIT, which to my surprise, to everybody's surprise, I went back to Mr. Cresswell and said, look, look, here's what I'm <laughs> lecturing. He said, um, this was in like 1977, he said, it's only because you're a woman, they have quotas to fill. Oh, no. And so that kind of um, set me on the course <laughs> that I would graduate from MIT no matter what. Yep. And um, and it was not easy. Um, when I got there, I realized that the bell curve had been renormalized, where I had been at the top without a whole lot of work. I was suddenly at the bottom and I was just working day and night and night and day. And I'm still was struggling all the time. I actually didn't do much other stuff there, just work. And the only reason I was in that MIT musical theater production was because there was another guy in my dorm who I had met in regional band in Pennsylvania. And he was the one who they recruited, but he's like, I, I have to, like, I can't do it. I have to go somewhere, do something. Could you sub in for me? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I did because, mm -hmm. you know, why not? And my dorm member, my fellow dorm mates were like, did you just learn to play those hymns? <laughs> You've never done that. Like, I'm like, no, no, no. I actually, this is what I use to do. Um, but I didn't go. I went when I went to MIT. I thought I might be an English major. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that really gives you the sense of how disconnected I was uh, from what was going on. So you were yeah. course twelve. You were in Earth and Planetary. Yeah, I was in Earth and Planetary Science. How did you find that? When I was a, a, a sophomore, second year, first year at MIT, everybody takes the required curriculum, just right. like basic physics, calculus, um, now biology, and other th chemistry. Um, but your second year, there were some opportunities for electives. And so I took a history course, and I took an astronomy course. And it was Jim Elliott. Uh, who was teaching this astronomy course. It was his first time. He had just come to MIT from Cornell. And uh, so I was like his first undergraduate in his first teaching class. And I was terrified because when I walked into this class, there were four students. There was me, a sophomore. There were um, there was two se one senior and two graduate <laughs> students. And I'm like, I don't belong in this mm. class. Anybody who stayed in the field, anybody we know? Yeah, I don't even remember. Okay. I, I was too terrified to understand <laughs> things like that. I was just like coping on an hour right. to hour basis at MIT. But he's like, but Jim said, no, no, Heidi, you're the one that I want. This is for undergraduates. I Those other people, just don't worry about them. You just do what you have to do. And so, um, you know, MIT has a little observatory, Wallace mm -hmm. Observatory. You're probably familiar with that. It's about 40 minute drive out of, the Cambridge area out in the countryside. And part of Jim's philosophy of teaching was that all the students did projects. That was, mm -hmm. he was a hands-on, you, you do astronomy. That is how you learn it. Uh, this was in Massachusetts. The weather is terrible. My project was not going <laughs> well. I was going under my sophomore year and I, I went into his office and, and he tells the story that my hands were clenched so tightly that my knuckles were white. And I said, I have to drop your course. And he said, why? Why are you dropping? No, I want you to be in my course. I said, I can't do it. You know, I, I either have to drop history or I have to drop astronomy and my project is not going well. And, and he I said, look, look, go to the observatory tonight and you'll get your data and you'll do your project. And we did. And it was clear and I got the data. And if that hadn't been clear that night, I think uh, we would be talking about history right now, not <laughs> astronomy. Uh, but Jim was a fantastic teacher and, and a really wonderful mentor. And he basically kept me in the field. He just kept me going. He had other astronomy courses at MIT as he was building his curriculum. He had me helping him. We bought telescopes to teach from the roofs of the building at MIT. You know, one thing led to another, and I just stayed in astronomy. It's fabulous. Because of him. I've, I've got to mention uh, the undergrad astronomy I took. Larry Lebowski on here was the TA. Hi, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some of the other people in my class were Bonnie Barati and Faith Vilas. A few other big names were, yep. you know, around ever since. It was sort of like the who's who came through astronomy yeah. at that time. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were other people, you know, the people in your class actually continued on. First of all, what was your parents' reaction to the fact that you were going to MIT? Did they think this was crazy? My mother thought it was awesome. My father thought it was 
nuts. It's like, why would anyone go to MIT when they could go to Penn State? <laughs> Okay. And so that was that was a challenge. And mm -hmm. um, even back then, MIT was pretty expensive. I had to do a lot of finagling. There's a sort of a classic family story. My guidance counselor, you know, I, I said I need a financial aid. And with the guidance counselor, we called MIT and they basically said, sorry, young lady, no, mm -hmm. no financial aid for you. And, um, but I thought you were part of the quota. Oh, dear. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's MIT. And, and they, believe me, their quota was very small back in the late 1970s. If that was what that was about. Yeah. You said, you can just go up there and talk to them. And so mm -hmm. my mom was out of town. I don't remember where she was. But I took her car and I got a friend and I drove up to Cambridge from Pennsylvania. And I walked into the financial aid office and said, here I am. You told me I can't get financial aid. What can we do about that? And they managed to come up with a package because I was in there in their yeah. office. That's sort of a kind of one of the things that I've always found. And when I talk to young people, I'm like, don't give up. When your chemistry teacher says you'll never get in, into MIT, you don't say, oh, gee, I'm not going to apply. And you just do it. And then when you can't you know, get financial aid, you like physically walk in there and say, make it happen. And mm -hmm. that's being tenacious, I think, is what has gotten me where I am today. <laughs> I don't give up. The next stage, of course, was getting into grad school. Right. Same thing. My physics GRE scores were terrible. Absolutely dreadful. I Which mean, is fairly typical for people <clears throat> in our field because we don't do that kind of physics. No. And I hadn't taken advanced physics at MIT. I'd taken on, you know, the basics, but not advanced physics because it was horror stories about the advanced physics courses. So the GRE scores were awful. And I was a really bad test taker, mm -hmm. too. It's just not my thing. Yeah. Um, so I applied to quite a few graduate schools and got rejected at all of them. And Jim Elliott said, this is nuts. You're going to be great at astronomy. I know it because we work together. So he pulled some strings, contacted some people at the University of Hawaii that he knew and said, I have this student. I'm going to be sending her out there to do observations for me. And um, I'm going to, you know, she's going to do the work. And I think you should take her into your graduate program. And Carl Pilcher was there. And, and so who was another TA when I was taking the course. So he was at MIT. But he was a professor at right. UH by then. And so he, you know, said, I will accept this student to come. And so when I got there, you know, I went out in August because Jim Elliott had this occultation and he had time on one of the telescopes, the UH telescope. And I walked in, I said, I'm here to do Jim Elliott's observations. And they said, grad students aren't allowed to use those telescopes. And I said, well, <laughs> Jim's not coming. I'm the one who's going to do it. And they said, and well. you didn't know that you were an undergrad. And, and Well, yeah, I don't know what they thought. They just, it was a very strange situation. You know, they so they said, well, well, we can't let you be at the telescope alone. You're just a graduate student. I said, well, fine. You find somebody else. And so Jay Gogan okay. was recruited. He was a postdoc at the time. He was recruited to come and sit at the telescope with me. <laughs> so we did this occultation observation for Jim Elliott and Jim Elliott. And uh, later on, and because I was observing, <clears throat> I missed the indoctrination of the graduate students. Uh, because I was on the, I was at the summit observing. And so I had to have my own indoctrination with mm -hmm. the then director, John Jeffries. And it sort of went like this. He called me into his office. It was a big office. Very, he's sitting behind the desk, very imposing. And I'm just this, you know, young lady. And I come in and I'm like, yes, sir. Nice to meet you, sir. He said, you know that the graduate students here are only here by our invitation. Um, we don't consider you scientists. I don't know how you managed to get time in the telescope, but you know, you, you know, we you should be down on the campus, not here in the Institute for Astronomy. But we'll let you have an office. We let the grad. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I, coming from uh, MIT and Jim Elliott's group, where every person there was considered a scientist, no matter what stage of your career you were, you were part of the team, you were expected to do the work, you were expected to contribute, to come into this situation where I'm told, I don't deserve to be there, but by the goodness of their heart, they'd let me in and have a, I was like, it was like really weird for me. So um, 
the other grad students were like, oh man, this is so hard. And I'm like, dudes, you do not know <laughs> what hard work is. This is, we're in Hawaii, you know, and, and, and this work, it's okay. It's, I mean, it's not that yeah. hard, but you know, they were, oh, it's so hard. I'm like, this is not hard. You guys don't know what hard is. <laughs> so who do you wind up working for? And what was your thesis project? So I was, I asked, um, I took an astrophysics degree. I was there to do astrophysics. I thought, you know, I'm not going to necessarily do planetary science, mm -hmm. even though that's mm -hmm. what Jim did. So I had a hardcore astrophysics course load, you know, galaxies, virial theorem, cosmology, stellar interiors, that sort of thing. When it came time to do a thesis, though, I, you know, was, I had done a lot of research projects on stars and galaxies, and I just thought they were not that interesting. <laughs> Ooh, don't tell people that. Now, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of the strategies you need to observe, um, what I had been doing with Jim Elliott was occultations, which is where a star, a body crosses in front of a star, and then you use the, the light curve of the body to learn things about it, like its atmosphere or its size, or in Jim's case, he discovered the rings of Uranus this way. And occultations are precision work. You had to be at the right place at the right time with the right instrument, and it all had to work, no excuses. Because if it didn't, if you missed it, you, you missed it. Whereas galaxies, it's like, oh, it's cloudy. Yeah, that galaxy is going to be there next year, 10,000 years from now, 100,000. It's going to be the same galaxy, you know, the same the stars don't change. So there was not this sort of challenge in this dynamic nature. And so I decided I'd, I wanted to go back to planetary. So I asked Carl Pilcher, I said, I hear you have a whole new set of atmospheric imaging filters, and we could use those to do the best work on Uranus and Neptune that's ever been done. And because this was before the Voyager flybys, this was in the early 1980s. And he's like, I think that's a fantastic idea. Here are my filters. And by the way, I'm leaving Hawaii to go to the Woodrow Wilson School of International Politics. You're on your own, kid. <laughs> I'm like, well, <laughs> okay. Never say never. Um, I went to Dale Cruikshank, who was another planetary astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy, and said, look, Carl gave me his filters to do outer planet imaging, but he's leaving. Can you be my thesis advisor? And Dale, to his credit, is like, I don't know anything about atmospheres, but I will get you anything you need to be successful. And he was a great advisor. He was just do you need to go to JPL to work with the atmospheric modelers? I said, yes, I do. He's like, all right, you're going to JPL. Do you want to be at the uh, Voyager Uranus flyby? I'm like, that would be great. He's like, you're going. And he just set it all up. And so although he wasn't working with me, he gave me every resource that I could use to do the work that I needed to in, do. In a practical sense, who was paying your salary? I mean, what grant was this all coming out of? Back in those days, uh, the University of Hawaii had a block grant from NASA. Mm -hmm. NASA was funding institutions in those days. And so we had a block grant from the Planetary Astronomy Program to be using these brand new telescopes on Mauna Kea to do planetary astronomy. And so I became part of that group. And I, I then was writing the section on using the telescopes on Mauna Kea to do atmospheric imaging and study the atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune. And so again, I was, Dale put me in the role of, you're the scientist, you write the section, you write the proposals, which was fine with me. I, that's what I had been trained to do at MIT. What telescope did you use? I mostly used the University of Hawaii 2.2 meter telescope. Okay. Back then in the 1980s, Keck had not been built. Gemini had not been built. Um, the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope was there. And I did try to use that one. I spent a week there and it was 100 mile an hour winds the entire week. Mm -hmm. And so never could even open the dome. I also used NASA's infrared telescope as well to do some work. But the bulk of the work of doing the imaging of Uranus and the imaging of Neptune was done with the 88 inch, um, the 2.2 meter of University of Hawaii. Which is not all that much bigger than our telescope in... in no. uh... No. So then yeah. Arizona, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and people, people forget that telescopes of that size are ideal for a lot of work because you can get the time and you can try things that, you know, you yeah. might not be able to get the time for in the bigger ones. Yeah. Now, of course, when I can get, because I'm trying to, my, you know, focusing yeah. on a planet like Neptune, 
And the, the disk of Neptune, for those of you who are astronomers, subtends two arc seconds. And the median seeing in a place like Arizona is like two arc seconds. Well, not so. in our place. No, what is no, it No, in Mount Graham, we can get 0.8. 0.8, yeah. that's good. Yeah. That's oh, good. Yeah. It's, it's, um, on Mauna Kea, part of what I did for my doctor. <laughs> peak is two arc seconds. Actually. Yeah. Um, but um, I worked very hard with the telescope then to take it, do everything we can to minimize the dome's contribution to the seeing so that we could get the natural guide, the natural seeing on Mauna Kea, which on Mauna Kea, what I found in my thesis, um, the natural seeing there is about 0.25 arc seconds. Ooh. That is why we. That's because there's no air there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're halfway to outer space, literally. You're working at 14,000 feet, and there's very little air there. So it's a very difficult environment to work with. Back then, uh, we did not have oxygen tanks. Well, we had oxygen tanks in the rooms so that if you started getting a little woo woo, you could, mm -hmm. you know, put a mask on, breathe some oxygen. Nowadays, they have little, little packs that everybody oh. can wear them. So you were doing a thesis on Uranus and Neptune, right? Uh, just because you had the filters, and what made you think Uranus and Neptune would be interesting? Because nobody does Uranus and Neptune <laughs> back then. Nobody <laughs> did. I just thought it would be interesting to try to do it. The telescopes on, on Mauna Kea were new. Um, we were using electronic cameras for the first time, um, so we had <laughs> new technology and new sensitivity. And with these filters that are sensitive to methane in the atmosphere, I think that there had been some trial runs with similar filters at telescopes in Chile, where they thought they saw blobs on Neptune. You know, it's, it, it's just barely resolved as a disk. But I thought I would give that a try. And, ne and Uranus would be twice as easy. It's four arc seconds across compared to Neptune's two. So I just thought it would be worth diving in and seeing okay. what we could see. It was experimental. And as you said, people hadn't really done it before and hadn't, hadn't tried. So, okay, <clears throat> you, you've got the thesis, you're, they, you defend, you've got your doctorate. Now, what are you going to do? Yeah. So what happened was when I was uh, looking at Uranus, I wasn't seeing anything on the planet. And, uh, and then Voyager flew by Uranus in 1986 and the Voyager images of the planet showed nothing to see. So I'm like, okay, good. I mean, that wasn't my technique. Uh, there really was nothing to see on Uranus. But Neptune, I was seeing strange shapes. I would see blobs and the blobs would move. And obviously they were clouds as the planet was rotating. So I was using those blobs to pull out rotation periods for the Which for people the didn't know at that time. I but remember the, a big dispute. The, there are many different- There were many different rotation, rotation periods. periods. Yeah. People have been trying to do this both with just pure light curves, looking at the light variability. And then there are uh, Brad Smith, who was the head of the Voyager imaging team and Rich Terrell, they had tried doing this with these methane filters and they had determined some periods. The periods that I was- the the rotation periods I was getting didn't match what Brad and Rich were getting. And I told Dale, I said, Dale, what their rotation periods aren't matching what's happening on Neptune. And that's important because we were like a year and a half away from the Voyager Neptune flyby. And so Dale arranged a meeting um, at one of our Division for Planetary Science meetings and and he there was it was I remember this it's like I was still a grad student it was before I had defended my thesis, and it was like a back room at the meeting it was dark you walk in and Brad Smith head of the Voyager imaging team and Brad and Rich Terrell his number two were sitting there kind of looking you know mm -hmm. grumpy because here I am telling them they're wrong. And, I, and and Dale walked in behind me, but he sat at the other end of the room and I was like alone, right? And I just laid out all my data on the table. I showed them how I had done the measurements. I showed them how I got the measurements I got. I showed them their rotation period didn't fit. And Brad just sort of sat back and said, hmm. And then he said, when you defend your thesis, I want you to come to JPL and join the Voyager imaging team. Wow. And that's how that happened. <laughs> and so um, I uh, I decided to um, reach to try to get a postdoc, a formal postdoc. I mean, he said that, but you have to get the postdoc position. So I reached out to Jay Bergstrahl at um, JPL. He said, yeah, you can come. I'm interested in outer planet imaging. Come to JPL, set you up as a postdoc. The day I got there, he said, oh, by the way, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going to go take a position at headquarters. I'm like, 
wait a minute. <laughs> this, this has is, happened before. This has happened before, but that's okay because I'll just do it on my own. And um, so I got there in February of 1988. And the Voyager Neptune encounter was in August of 1989. And I just worked straight through that period of time with the Voyager imaging team, analyzing the images of Neptune. And they were not boring. Uh, you know, as soon as we got a better resolution than we could see from the Earth, we started making discoveries. The great dark spot on Neptune, bright little clouds, a second great dark spot, uh, all kinds of interesting dynamical activity on Neptune. And uh, so it was very exciting throughout that period until about four months before the encounter in um, August of 1989, Brad Smith called me into his office and he said, Heidi, we need to have ground-based imaging to go with our Voyager imaging. We need the ground truth so we can understand what we were seeing and you were seeing and we need that. And I said, you are right, we need that. And he said, you are the world's expert in imaging Neptune. We need you to make the observations. And I'm like, but, but that means I won't be here for the Voyager flyby. <laughs> and he looked at me and I looked at him and I'm like, okay, I'll write my observing proposals. So I missed the Voyager flyby. I, did, I wasn't there at JPL. I wasn't there for the big party with Chuck Berry and Paul Sagan. <laughs> when you look at the videos of the Voyager flyby, I'm not there because I was on a mountaintop thousands of miles away mm -hmm. taking data of Neptune. Um, and it was great data, and we were able to use it to understand what we had been seeing with those blobs and why they changed. It turned out that the great dark spot, which we couldn't see from the Earth, you needed to have blue wavelengths. And we were looking at near-infrared methane filters. It always had companion clouds. And the companion clouds were what we had been seeing and we learned from Voyager that the great dark spot drifts in latitude up and down. And when it does, it speeds up and slows down. And that's why I had one rotation period, but Brad and Rich had been looking a few years earlier when the great dark spot had been in a different location. And that's why they had a different rotation period. But mine was the one we needed for Voyager because it was closest in time. So it was important, but that was a heartbreaker oh, to miss imagine. the Voyager miss the Voyager flyby of Neptune after spending, you know, almost a decade trying to understand the clouds. So we get into the early 90s and we come to the event that made you famous. Right. Briefly. Karmic payback, I yes. say, for the missing Voyager. <laughs> right. um, and we're talking about the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact on Jupiter. Um, I had uh, finished my postdoc at JPL, gone back to MIT. Jim Elliott said, come back. Mm -hmm. And um uh, I remember uh, they just that uh, um, Gene Shoemaker and Carolyn Shoemaker and David Levy using telescopes in Arizona had found a comet that was orbiting Jupiter. And when we the when its when its orbit was calculated, we discovered it was going to hit Jupiter. And um, my uh, down the hall for me at MIT was a, a fellow named Tim Dowling who was running atmospheric simulations of Jupiter, and he ran a, a simulation where you put a a, a, a an impact or a, a, a point source, um, you know, event into the atmosphere and said, what happens? Dump a bunch of energy. And Dump see a what... bunch of energy. Yeah. What's going to happen to the atmosphere? And it set up big ripples in the atmosphere. Looked like expanding rings. And he's like, we're going to see those with the Hubble Space Telescope. And I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy talk. <laughs> he's like, yes, we will, Heidi. And I'm a theorist, but you're an observer. And you already wrote one proposal for Hubble, which is to look at Neptune. So could you write another one to look for these expanding rings? I said, OK. And then a few weeks later, I got a phone call from the director of Space Telescope saying, Heidi, we picked your proposal. I'm like, yay. And we picked six other ones. And we want you to combine them all into one program and you will be the leader of the program and i'm like what i don't know about that You're a still. I, I was just like yeah pump stock and i had observed jupiter but i'd never written a paper about it at that point i'd never used hubble and mm -hmm. so i didn't know like how to even use hubble and um but you know what are you gonna you can't say no <laughs> so i said <laughs> okay <laughs> sure and so um put together this 
proposal. And you remember, none of us knew what was going to happen. So there was Tim's expanding rings to look for. Um, some of my colleagues um, at Sandia National Laboratory, Mark Boslow and Dave Crawford, they cornered me at an AGU meeting and said, you are going to see these huge plumes expanding out of the atmosphere when these explosions take place. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> they're like, no, no, you will. And I'm like, but it's on the far side. We, we won't see that. They're like, they're going to be so big. They're going to stick out and you'll see them with Hubble. I'm like, okay, guys. And there were other predictions that people had made. So the team and I set out a timeline using our 100 hours of, of 100 orbits of Hubble time to say, well, let's look for rings. Let's look for plumes. Let's look for whatever happens. And um, I honestly didn't expect anything to happen. I was in the, you know, the, the Paul Weissman school of the big fizzle, like <laughs> comets are tiny, Jupiter's huge, <laughs> nothing's going to happen. I was talking to the BBC the night before the impacts started. It was going to take a week for all these impacts to happen. And I said, I don't really think we're going to see my, maybe little tiny white spots uh, on the atmosphere of Jupiter. I have never been so wrong in my entire life. We saw everything. We saw the giant plumes so high, they stuck out beyond the limb of Jupiter. We saw the expanding rings that Tim had predicted. Instead of little white spots, we saw massive dark spots. And when I say, when I say huge, I mean, these dark spots were larger than the size of the earth. And what they were, they were when the, these giant plumes of material erupted thousands of kilometers high, they then collapsed onto the cloud tops and left debris, sooty debris. That's what those dark spots were. They were just debris fields from the impacts. And every impact that happened left a debris field. Uh, and yeah, it was it was wild. It was a wild week. And we were using Hubble just a few months after the first servicing mission. Those of you might, who know Hubble remember the, the tragic story of the Hubble mirror being incorrectly shaped by just the, the width of a human hair. But that was enough to, to, to mess up the images. There was spherical aberration. So just in January, the astronauts had gone up and put in a whole new set of cameras and corrective optics. And so this was the first time I, I think that we could compare Hubble with effectively every single telescope on Earth, because every telescope on Earth was looking at shoemaker levy 9 impacts on Jupiter, and the Hubble data were absolutely spectacular. They were so much better than anything any other telescope could produce that I, I, I sort of... I take a little bit of credit for rehabilitating Hubble's <laughs> image. Uh, so to speak. Yeah, so to speak. No one could say that Hubble was not performing at its you know, diffraction limit. It was, and it was just spectacular. And yeah, so I got catapulted into this fame because I, I was leading the team and the images were so spectacular that NASA was like, well, we have to do a press conference. And then the next day, well, they're even more spectacular. We need to do another press conference. So I was doing press conferences sort of every single day for NASA, um, just being the voice of the Hubble Space Telescope and the, and the team. And we tried to get the other team members in there too. But um, I tended to... Um, speak as if I was speaking to my relatives. And remember, there's no scientists in my family. So what was I going to tell my uncle Larry, right? Who's like worked in the Mack truck factory and his, my aunt Lucille, who worked in the cafeteria of the Mack truck factory. I had to use language and imagery that they could understand because I wasn't going to get all super technical. And it was incredibly popular. People thought that was so unusual to have a scientist you know, enthusing about science because we were just having fun. It was crazy town. We didn't know what was going on. And I would just get on the NASA press conference and say, well, we got new images today. We have no idea. We don't understand this. We've never seen anything like this before, but it looks like Jupiter's got a big black eye where it just got hit by the comet. And um, yeah, so it, it was uh, it was pretty spectacular. Now, I've met many astronomers in our field. You tend to be on TV a lot. And I know people who have you know, been on Johnny Carson and that sort of thing. I don't know anyone else who has had a children's book written about them. <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah, this is a, a book series that the National Academy of Sciences wanted to do about women in science. But they didn't want it to be about, you know, Marie Curie, right? 
or Rosalind Franklin or people that you have black and white pictures. They wanted it to be about um, current women in science. And so um, they recruited authors and then the authors said who they wanted to write about. And uh, the author, Fred Bortz, they recruited him and he, he wrote the book about me. It's really not, it's not so much a kid's book. It's a middle, it's for middle school age kids. But it really was not about the science so much, but it was like, how did you end up being an astronomer, you know, or um, uh, a, a specialist in robotics or a specialist in geology or a specialist in forensic science? The book series was about all different kinds of women doing interesting things. And so um, I, because I had just had this sort of like this big splash and my name was known, they included me in that book series. It, it's called uh, Beyond Jupiter. And so it, it's a, it was really fun to write. Do you um, do you ever feel uncomfortable sort of being a, a poster child in that sense? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, I do. Um, I, I but I try to roll with it because I think it's important to communicate science. And what I have seen now in my career in the decades since Shoemaker Levy Nine is so many more women, young women. Uh, being enthusiastic about their science and not trying to hold back. And so I sort of feel like I was a, a vanguard in this. And it isn't just women, it's young men too. They don't feel that they have to be inhibited about their science. You know, I think, I think Mr. Spock from Star Trek has a lot to answer for because it set this paradigm that a lot of scientists really played into that, you know, science is logical and serious and very, you know, we don't, we don't talk a lot about it. And, and you you know this, you remember Carl Sagan and how how much crap he took yeah. from our community and from the astrophysics community for being a popularizer, a popularizer of science and I, I, un, unnecessary. And uh, I, I think that my role as a very enthusiastic presenter of science helped to, to change this, that we could express joy in science. We could express our love for what we do. We could share the fact that we don't have all the answers, that science isn't about having answers. Science is about pursuing questions and exploring into the unknown. And it's okay to say, I don't know, I don't understand, but that's why we're doing this work. But of course, that was all in the 90s when that happened, and that was years ago, and you've had now a very boring elderly career. Uh, you're not involved with looking at Jupiter or Hubble anymore. You're you're stuck with some other, what, what's the name of that uh, telescope again? There's buttons on the wall. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope. Do you have something to do with that? Yeah, a little bit. So tell us what you're doing with James Webb and what fun you've had. When I uh, got to use Hubble for Shoemaker Levy 9, I have to say I had nothing to do with building Hubble, nothing at all. I was just, it was there for me as a young scientist and it was spectacular. And um, around that same time, I was, you know, I was on the other side of Shoemaker Levy 9. I was still using Hubble to study Uranus and Neptune New telescopes were coming online, like the Keck and Gemini, and I was going to use them to study Uranus and Neptune, but I really wanted to have a mission. And I remember having a conversation with one of our colleagues, Torrance Johnson, who was at that time working on the Galileo mission to Jupiter. I said, Torrance, where's, where's the Neptune mission? Where's the Uranus mission? And he said, Heidi, your generation dropped the ball on that. I'm like, what? I'm, I'm just like barely out of postdoc. I didn't even know there was a ball, let alone that I was dropping balls. I'm like, I can't, I can't run a, you know, a Neptune mission. So I, I was looking around at options and I had heard about this idea for a next generation space telescope. And these astrophysicists had started talking about that even before Hubble was launched. And I was sitting there going, you know what? Hubble revolutionized our understanding of Jupiter and impacts. It's revolutionizing our understanding of the planet Neptune. I want to get involved in that next generation space telescope because that's going to be the revolutionary thing. And this was in the late 1990s. Um, and I just, uh, 
started asking people, how do I get involved in this thing? You know, and they had no planetary astronomers. They were just a bunch of astrophysicists. They were like, we're, we're, we don't need to look at planets. This telescope's going to look at the first galaxies in the universe. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, Hubble wasn't designed to look at planets either. And look what we're doing. Our colleague, Phil Nicholson, had been involved with that group. And they were asking him to look at um, Kuiper Belt objects and what they could do. They the only thing that astrophysicists could imagine that could be done with this next generation telescope was to look at Kuiper Belt objects like Pluto and the 10,000 Pluto friends and relations out there. And so I said, I ran into Phil. I'm like, you know, I'm really interested in this. And he's like, okay, Heidi, well, I'm about to take over editor of Icarus. I don't have time. Here's all my files on this next generation space telescope. You go girl. I'm like, okay. Um, and uh, so I started working on the project with the astrophysicist. It was hard. They had no interest in planetary science. Um, but when NASA put out a call for the formal science working group, I wrote a proposal saying, I, will, I wanna be on the science working group because I wanna make sure that this next generation space telescope can look at solar system objects. And I reached out across the community and I said, how about Mars? How about Jupiter? How about Neptune? How about comets, asteroids? You think it'll be interesting? And people are like, well, yeah. So I wrote this proposal and NASA accepted it. Without that, would the, the web have the capability of following objects that are moving at a different, you know, in space rather than just standing still? Possibly not. Um, they also selected Jonathan Lunin, and, and he wasn't sort of broad solar system. He was more interested in just Titan and exoplanets and maybe some Kuiper Belt objects. But he and I were both on the science working group. And a few years into the formal project, one day we got an email with the new level one science requirements. Level ones are like must have, must achieve. Moving target tracking was gone. It had been taken out. And we're like, wait, what? Uh, because you know we've been working with this all along, and and it it took seven years of work, both on my part, Jonathan's part, and with the support of the rest of the science working group, and with Jim Green, who was working at NASA headquarters as head of the planetary science division. All of us working, all the angles, everything we could to get it restored, and we did. And you know, kudos to Jim Green who helped a lot, and to you know Lenine who worked with me. Um, but it was not easy. And I think if we hadn't been on the science working group, this telescope probably would not have been launched with moving target capability, like Hubble was launched without moving target <laughs> tracking capability, and it had to be retrofitted. Ooh. Yeah, and it was not easy. So it, we made it happen. By then, it was, had been renamed James Webb Space Telescope. You know, when we originally wrote our proposals in 2002, we, years ago. we were expecting a launch around 2011 or 2013. And, and then over the years, it became 2014 and 2016. And, you know, it was a long road. Um, there yeah. was a marvelous graph of year and projected launch of James Webb. And you'd see where the two lines would intersect. And they intersected about but it actually went up. They, they got yeah. that right. Yeah. We'll end then with the image that as of you know, October 2022 sort of culminated Neptune, James Webb. Right. Describe your moment seeing that image. Well, I want to say that, um, first of all, it wasn't my data. Um, my, my science uh, program for Neptune had not executed yet. It had not been taken. But the um, the folks at Space Telescope Science Institute wanted to take a pretty picture. They had done, you know, really beautiful, pretty pictures. So they took a picture of Neptune. I wasn't involved in it. I'd heard a rumor that there was a Neptune picture. My postdoc at um, Goddard was asked to be the science advisor for them on that so she showed me the picture and I, and, and super secret, right? Couldn't talk about it, but it was amazing. The, the planet was amazing, but was what blew my mind was the ring system of Neptune in all of its glory. I had not seen that since the Voyager flyby in 1989. So 30 years have gone by and suddenly there was the ring system again. Now we had tried with Hubble, with Keck, and we have like little, like, like 
little bits of the ring system. It's because the rings have bright arcs, but it's the faint stuff that you yeah, can see. Yeah, and you can see the ANSI, like the, mm -hmm. the outer edges. And you can see that. But what we saw in James Webb, because of its amazing sensitivity and, and stability, we saw the dust sheets like all the way in close to the planet, which we had just not and been able to see except with a spacecraft. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I called my mom, mom, look at this, called my kids, look at this. I held my cats up to the screen, cats, look at this. It was just so exciting. And it, they're, they're beautiful images. They were not taken for science. They were taken to make pretty pictures. We do have a science programs coming up. And so it was just, just hammered home that all these 25 years of working was worth it absolutely worth it so and great stuff coming from james webb space telescope and given your position here and your position with the web you've been given a certain number of time uh, number of hours yeah when i was selected in 2003 <laughs> to be one of the interdisciplinary scientists with that came guaranteed time on james webb space telescope so i had uh guaranteed 100 hours of space telescope time which you're jealously guarding and holding on and what are you doing Not, that time? I actually gave all of my time away to the solar system community, um, to people doing comets, people doing asteroids, people going to look at Uranus and Neptune, people uh, doing Kuiper Belt object stuff. And I, I made it a condition uh, for these young people to get all this data. I said, if you, you have to agree that that time is a mate, those images and spectra are made immediately available to the entire community, no proprietary time. Because the whole purpose of my doing this work was that our community got solar system data so that they understood what JWST can do. And you know, you young person, I'm putting you in charge, but you have to agree that anybody can get the data. And so it's been a bit of a crazy time. We are now getting data and it's going into the archive and other people are downloading it and making their own pictures. And, and I'm like, at some level, I'm, I'm frustrated because I want my team, those young people, I want those young people to get the credit, but I was the one who made the choice <laughs> to make it publicly available. And I think in the end, it is the right thing to do um, because we want everyone who wants to use James Webb to understand how to use it. Um, to see from our example, you know, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? Mars saturates almost everywhere. You know, we need to know that so that we can plan in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, um, I think it's important for senior level scientists to give back to the community. I think that's what, that's our job is to make it available. Somebody made Hubble available for me and I made James Webb Space Telescope available for our current generation of young people. That's a wrap for this podcast. The audio editor for this podcast was myself, Bob Trembley. You can listen to our other podcasts and read our posts on the web at vaticanobservatory.org. If you'd like to attend our full moon meetups live, join our sacred space astronomy community also at vaticanobservatory.org. Clear skies, everyone.